So we're going to go back in the interface builder. We're going to start hooking up um, code and uh, interfaces together. And actually making an app that, that does something. Um, it's going to be really kind of reduced and ridiculous, but it will do something. All right, so we'll have, it'll come out of today with a couple of real live iPhone apps that actually behave more than just kind of sliding in. So today, um, this is a rather ambitious list that comes from the course material that's been, been uh, put together for us. So we're, we're probably not going to get into all of this, but we'll, get, we'll definitely get to the most important stuff that will carry us through the rest of the course. Yes. You did not post this, right? No, I didn't, I didn't post it. I'm a little behind. I apologize for that. I'm, I'm like a day behind. You just want to make sure it's not Yeah. No, I can, I can, I can push it out. Now I cannot print it. <laughs> yeah. So um, the ones that we're going to the ones that we're going to focus on um, are uh, generally the first two: create hooks for UI elements and switch code, and identifying the methods associated with the controllers and UI elements and how you So um, that's a fancy way of saying we're going to hack the code that Xcode gives us when we create a new. In the near future, we're going to tackle the different view controllers that um, that uh, UI kit gives us. So, if you remember back in the first three classes, we talked about a couple of view controllers. Um, we didn't actually know exactly what they did, but um, or, or how to use them. Right? We knew what they did. So, for example, a table view controller uh, we know makes a list of table view, uh, makes a table view and has table view cells that can contain information in them, so very much like the Twitter app and the, the Twitter feed. Um, so the first couple of apps that you did were all about um, using segues and using sort of the default components and default behaviors that the interface builder gives us. But eventually we're going to get to a state where we can present new views programmatically. And what that means we're going to write code to add views to a view controller. So whatever scene you're looking at, Depending on the behavior, you can add new content to it dynamically. Um, and then, um, if we can get to it, we'll show, uh, we'll try to demonstrate where to find documentation for uh, for UI elements and for view controllers, because it's going to be, it's going to, it's going to start to make more sense for you to go find information than for us to just deliver it to you, like in slideshows, essentially. Um, like you know enough now about the terminology that you should be able to dive into the documentation and find your way around and begin to absorb more uh, more material, more context. Um, okay, sound good. So we're going to we're going to focus on these first two. Get a live app that actually executes some Swift code that should be somewhat familiar. Excited? Let's do it. I'm excited. Uh, first, um, we're going to review uh, a little bit about where we've been. Um, where have we been? Where are we going? So, where we've been, um, values and types. This forms the foundation of everything that is Swift. We have four fundamental types that we talked about uh, during that lesson. Integers, doubles and floats, um, pools and strings. And so, in Swift, you have to be very aware all the time, as we know, what type we're dealing with when we're talking about a piece of information. information. So um, then we talked about variables. So what does it mean to declare a variable? Constantine. Do you remember? What is, declare, what is declaring a variable in your own words? Initiate it and give, give it the types and then assign it. That's pretty much it, I think. Um, so it's the process of telling Swift that, in this case, my name means something. It makes that variable available. Um, what does it mean to initialize a variable? Meg, what does it mean to initialize a variable? I know, I Look remember it doing it. I'm sorry? I remember doing it. Okay, Look um, it up in your notes when you're in yeah. the unit. You should all have, all have notes that you can access easily if you don't remember. This is not a memory test. This is a refresher.
initialize comes from initial. Right, that's right. Okay. It does indeed. So, the thing that it comes from initial. So, declaring means telling Swift that my name means something, that it's a string, it will contain a string. And then to initialize it means that I'm, it, I know its type, but I don't know its, uh, its value. So if I initialize a variable, maybe, what, hap what happens? What does that enable us to do? Um, sorry, to answer. Um, uh, I don't know. Sorry, I'm just looking for it in my notes. It's okay. We'll come back to you. Okay. Eric, what does it mean to initialize a variable? It means setting its value. That's right. Setting its which value? Its which value? Yeah. It's well. It's it's, it's it declared value. Initial value. It's the first value that it's going to have. So, absolutely right. So, then in this syntax down below, we're assigning a variable. So, Raj, what does it mean to assign a value to a variable? Uh, to, to initialize it. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. You give it a new value. Right? So, we can change the value of a variable by just using this simple syntax. <laughs> Allison, what's the difference between a variable and a constant? Right, and it goes one line at a time from the top of the code block to the 
So, Raj, in this case, what do I call this word here, number? What do I, what do we, do we have a term for that? Did we say it already? Pretty much right. So it's trying to take a class and then take that what that definition of a class and produce an object that lives on its own that has these properties, the properties that we that we set through the parameters of the initializer, and then it's set to this variable. So now we can use that object in, in whatever context that comes afterwards, just like any other value it becomes a value. What does it mean to extend a class? Any ideas? This is a I have a question now. Because no ideas. I don't remember what I would want to do. Okay, fair enough. To give it additional behavior. Yes, that's right. What we're going to do in this case is produce a new class called Shiva that has all of the behavior that dog has. Um, plus some. We can do we can add behavior to it and we can change behavior to it. So Eric, what does this override keyword do? Like this is a new thing that's come up. Yeah, it's just essentially taking the bar method in the basically the original or the, the, yes. the super class original class. Yeah. And it's saying take that function for that method and uh, do something. 
instead of calling dog the bark function that comes from dog, whenever you have a Shiba, you're going to call this line instead. So then it prints out Shiba's not bark. Which is true most of the time. The question for this extended class. I'm sorry, say only for the extended class. That's right. Not yeah. the class. That's right. Yeah, it's not it's not pushing any logic back to dog. Um, it only exists in the sh in the world of the, sh of the Shiba. Yeah. So to review, to review, I'm going to take that class and play with it a little bit. Um, and so you don't have to follow along with this. I just want you to kind of remember what it was like to deal with deal with class. I want to give you that's a little hint that I'm going to say. So we have a class dog. So this should be the same, should be the same exact thing there. And then uh, I'm actually going to make Bart return a string because print line is kind of annoying in, in the playground because it dissociates its location. So I have my dog. So I have, I have the same class for dog. And now I have a variable, my dog, which equals which equals this syntax, which initializes a new dog. And now I can access its properties using dot notation. I can also access a method using dot notation. Is that the same thing as inheritance? Um, we say, when we extended a class, mm -hmm. um, we say that the class Shiva inherited some properties and some methods from dog, right? So, um, so in a moment, I can demonstrate what inheritance looks like. There we go. So Toshi says mark. And then the point of objects is now I can I can create more than one of them, just like I can have more than one integer. I've got an infinite, you know, in the mathematical world, I have an infinite number of them to choose from. Everything from zero to forty-eight quadrillion. Um, it's the same kind of thing. Integer is the type or the or the class, and a specific instance of it can be the number one, the number two, the three, etc., and so on. So it's the same principle. You kind of have this intuitive understanding from math that you know an, an integer or a whole number or a or a real number is um, is a, a kind of type, and then you have specific instances of it like pi. Um, but um, since this gives you the power to make your own types, it kind of turns, it kind of turns your mind inside out a little. It's like generalizing the universe around you, um, which I hope eventually um, will be a good thing. So, but my point is, is that I can have another variable, my sister's dog, which equals another dog. So now, my, my dog, my sister's dog, have, have very little to do with each other. They have the same methods, they have the same properties, but the values that those properties contain are completely independent of each other. Does that make sense? So I can, I can do a whole bunch of work on my sister's dog and then without having it affect my dog. And so what this does is it enables us to, what they, well, as we say, encapsulate some related data together. So everything that has to do with my sister's dog, like its age, its species, its breed, like all of that stuff, I can encapsulate in that variable and, 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 uh, and use that as my sort of organizational unit to move it around my app and then display its data in various contexts, change it, etc., and so on, without having to worry about any other dog in my own. same 
same behavior for Bart. Boom. But I can override that behavior because Shivas are special.
actually happens at the it's happens at the class definition time. Isn't it? So this that piece of code is executed when the class is defined. This piece of code is executed when the instance is defined. Okay. So if you wanted them all to be the same, like when when it's when they're instantiated, you can set it there. But I really haven't found any advantage in doing that. Have you found a context where you've done that before? Where you would set a default and also pass it in the initializer? No, just setting a default at the top. Without doing it without doing it in the initializer. Oh, our player passed that a default no longer. Yeah, but you can do it in the initializer. You could. Um I don't like putting my defaults in the initializer. Yeah. This makes it easier for whoever's using the class to read to understand that that's just a default path. Unless I'm using multiple initializers. Yeah. yeah. I don't I think I don't like it because isn't if this code is actually executed at the definition time, couldn't you? Is that done by reference? I'm confusing myself. So let's do let's run an experiment. Thank you. 
want to set the value at instantiation time. And when you want to set the value according to some calculation that you have to do. So um, if there are if there are values that mean different things, like you had a property that was um, positive or negative, and you had this special number class that you were using because you were making a kids app about math, um, and then you wanted to actually just record whether something was positive or negative um, for some reason, then if you passed in the value like 12, then you would then you could probably record the number 12 and then record the value positive or something. Um, that's a bad example because you can keep that instead of setting it. But, um, or a class that takes a class that has an age property, but the initializer takes in a year. So you would have you would take that, that uh, parameter a year to calculate the age property for that class. Yes. Do you all understand what, what Angel was talking about? Um, so his example was, let's say I have a second initializer here. Um, right? So you can have multiple initializers, by the way, to give, to respond to the context um, of a, uh, the, to, to enable instant the process of instantiating to respond to its context and whatever information is available. Um, so let's say you had a user, you had a user class, and you have a, a sign-up form for them, and their age is optional. Like you could have an initializer that accepts an age, but you could also have an initializer that does not accept an age for those two scenarios. Okay. Also a bad example, because there are other ways to handle that, but that's the, the gist of it. What information is there? the name of Toshi's owner, but I did not change the name of Layla's owner. So there's a very so the way that um, the way that objects work I think it's, a only... it's because it's a different person. So this person is instantiated when the instance is instantiated, which means that every dog will have a different person as its owner. If I wanted to have the same owner for both Toshi and and my and my sister's dog. Let's say my sister has two dogs. I could I could instantiate another person like this, and 
then I can set that owner. Here's the trick. What if my sister changed her name? Change for both of them because it's the same person, right? Sort of, sort of intuitive because of the way I've written it and the way I've been talking about it. This is what we call um, passing a value by reference. So it means that wherever I use the value my sister, if that ever changes, it will change every other place that my sister has ever been used or referenced. And so if you think about objects as uh, like people, like an independent thing that you've created, and whenever something about that thing, that sort of imaginary person changes, it changes everywhere else, then it just it, it makes sense. And you won't ever have to think about this. So. Um, but if I create, if I had created another person for down here, even though she had the same name, it's a completely different person. So whenever you hit, whenever you initialize an object, it creates a completely independent, different object uh, from all others. But wherever you use it, it's always, it's always the same. this init function is just a function like any other function. Then what's the point of setting the name here? Up here? Yeah. Um, no, this, up above the init. Here? No, property. This one? The, the property name. name. No. Yes. Straight this one? This one? Right there. This is, okay, so this is the property definition or declaration. Okay, so why don't you have that for year one? Um, oh. Um, because this is just a 
a demonstration of the fact that the, the arguments that init has to take uh -huh. don't have to line up one-to-one -one with the properties that you're storing. Gotcha. And so one possible scenario is I created this class and I have a whole bunch of properties and then and then and we, and then we write a thousand lines of code that depend on that object. Then my user experience designer comes in and says, "Oh, well, you know, we're going to change this field in the sign-on process because it makes more sense to get someone's year that they're born." Yeah. Right? It's like, and then you go back and then it might make sense to actually add an initializer that accepts year born. But now you don't have to change any code because you're restoring this, you're storing the same amount, the same information that you had before. You don't have to change your thousand lines of code now. There are other reasons why that might not work very well, but like so the name properties is required because because it's not optional because it's not. You see how that you see how that works? See how clever the Apple engineers are when they named that type the optional type? Yes. So this is not optional. You have to do it. You have to give it a value.
and I think that it's the right thing to do because I'm hoping that all the syntax that you see in these files you recognize now. So what I want what I want you to do is nothing. Um, I want you to follow along with what I do. Well, no, sorry, I do not want you to follow along. I want you to just watch what I'm doing, and then we'll go back and you can repeat. Okay, and then. Uh, Yes, and um, I think we'll repeat after the break. And then there's another um, assignment, that, another um, uh, exercise that you'll all do in pairs together. Yeah. And it'll be it'll be relatively simple, but uh, very relevant. Okay. So all I've done is created a project, call it Outlets, and I've disabled um, auto layout. given to us by Apple in this 